I'll just write this roughly for you know for myself. Okay, so so let me begin with two clarifications from yesterday's lecture. There, there were two confusions. One of them was public. One of them was not. But I think it's it's worth uh, writing it out. So the first confusion was my stupidity. I just used two different. I used the same notation for two different things. Psi mu always in in all the textbooks in all our presentations is the gravitino. There are two of them. Uh, psi mu i one, equal to one two. So those are the gravitini. And epsilon i I've always used as scaling spinner. But when I started to do this method of bilinears and forming these scaling vectors and scalars and so on, <coughs> I used the notion of psi, and there was a little bit of confusion. Just to say, what I did was um, essentially psi is just epsilon. There are two of these things: epsilon one and epsilon two. Okay, so I just use epsilon one plus i epsilon two equal to psi. Maybe a better notation would have been epsilon, but in the paper I used with with Rajesh Gupta, I used psi, and then I took that in my notes and so on. Okay, that's all it is. And you see that so these are symplectic Majorana. The two of them. The reason we combine it like that is then you get a Dirac. You can just easily write bars instead of always writing i j and epsilon i j. Okay, so it's a very silly confusion. I, I say this because today also there will be many psi's and epsilon. So, okay. The other one was a slightly more serious one. Um, it's just that I didn't write enough yesterday because I was out of town. So let me uh, out of time. So let me <laughs> clarify it. So the the action. So there are three parts of the action. The bulk action, which is the usual one, which is given to you. This can be. Um, I wrote it down two lectures ago. The, boundary, uh, the Wilson line and the boundary action. The bulk action and the Wilson line I spent enough time on. And then when you, eva so these are local, exp this is a local gauge invariant expression. This whole thing is gauge invariant. When you evaluate it on this localization manifold, you get these expressions which I wrote down on the board. And then the same thing is true of the S boundary. S boundary, this is the part I didn't write, has a local gauge invariant expression. Okay, there, here it is. And you can see, check that this thing is supersymmetric. A plus B plus C is supersymmetric. And then when you evaluate it on M, M localization, this is the expression I wrote yesterday. Okay? I just wrote this directly as if it's just something proportional to R naught. It actually comes from a gauge moment local term. And the whole thing is finite. Okay? So these are the two clarifications I wanted to make. So today, uh, so now let me recap. I'm going to use a combination of computer and uh, and blackboard. So first, let me just recap yesterday. So there were four steps in the localization. The zeroth step was uh, the first step here. Uh, there are more people here, so I'll start here. Um, so the first one is just you find the formalism that we discussed a lot in the school. The second one is you have to find all solutions of these localization equations with the ADS two times S2 boundary conditions. And the answer was that in a certain gauge, the while multiplet um, has no other solution except the classical full BPS ADS two times S2. And in each vector multiplet, there is a solution where all the vector fields, um, so the gauge fields, are, are exact, take the classical values, the attractive values, and the Scalar fields xi, complex scalars, the real part of the complex scalar, is excited uh, off shell. So this, there's a shape like this, which I wrote down yesterday. Um, and uh, this uh, shape is dictated by uh, supersymmetry. It's not on shell, and it's supported by one auxiliary field, yij, which is not 0. The size is arbitrary. The size was called phi i. And the problem then reduced to integrating over these sizes, these n plus 1, nv plus 1 parameters, real parameters phi i. Then you have to take the full supergravity action, the one over there, evaluate them on these solutions. That's just an exercise. And I remind you that this includes all kinds of terms, all kinds of local terms that you can add. Um, and uh, then there was a D terms don't contribute statement. And when you do all this, you get this expression uh, here. It's the sum of these three things. And then you have to compute the determinant and measure, for which there's a lot of work. And today I'm going to talk about this. Um, at the end of the day, you get this very nice formula that for n equal to 2, four dimensional n equal to 2 supergravity, ungauged supergravity, coupled to NV vector multiplets, if you take a black hole carrying charges pi and qi, then this ADS2 functional integral, which is exponential of the quantum entropy, was equal to this n dimensional integral, n plus 1 dimensional integral. Okay, so it's the um, integral of exponential of S renormalized, which itself is a Lajano transform of imaginary f, 
evaluated on this localizing solution. So the answer is very, very nice and pretty times a Z1 loop. F here is the holomorphic prepotential of um, uh, supergravity. Okay. So this was the summary. Any questions so far? Yeah, can you just uh, shout out? Yeah. This one? Here. This, this plus this goes to that. That's the boundary term. So that's A, B, and C. Other questions? Yeah, so just a word of, so I've been mostly careful with my formulas in all, all the talks. So if you've been taking notes, but I might be off with signs and I's and stuff. Don't trust that completely. Uh, but I gave you references, and you can look at them. Paper. All right. So today, my goal is to I want to talk about this term, this one loop determinant. Okay. So let me close that. Um, so today, so I want to show you an expression. Well, so the, let me first announce the result. The result is the following. The result is this Z1 loop. So suppose you have a theory of while, and then there are vectors and hypers. Okay, we didn't treat hypers, but suppose there are hypers. Then the answer is this. It's exponential of minus k evaluated at phi plus i pi times 2 minus chi over 24, where chi is 2 times nv minus nh plus 1. And for those of you who learned any string theory, you will immediately recognize this as the Euler number of the Calabiao in the type 2. And if you think of this n equal to 2 supergravity as coming out of type 2 on a certain Calabiao, this combination is precisely the Euler number, and it's that that appears. Okay? But from the low energy point of view, you just see it as the number of fields, nv and nh. Huh? Nh, ah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. OK, so that's the answer. and. What I'm going to do, I won't derive this in full detail. But what I would like to do, since there were many discussions, but not too many discussions of this determinant, I want to go through the, the method of computing the determinants in this off-shell theory. Okay? So there are two methods. So one loop, Z one loop. So, so that's. Uh, so you can either. Do an explicit computation. This is, this is. I think Francesco did this in his second or third lecture, one of the lectures. He at least sketched some kind of an explicit computation. What does it mean, explicit computation? Well, you know what this is. What you have to compute is, you have some QV action. I wrote it out. It's psi bar cube psi summed over out psi, and Q of that. So it's some action. You have to truncate it to quadratic terms. And you have to ask what is the one loop, what is the quadratic fluctuation determinant? That's the task. It's a very explicit action. You can try to do it, but it's it's a, it becomes harder and harder as the theory becomes more and more complicated. Um, and you have to do it off shell. You have to evaluate this at a generic point uh, on this localization manifold, this off shell manifold. This should be a function of phi i, as you see the answer. Okay. Um, the other method is more sophisticated. Uh, so it involves some learning some mathematics, but it's actually extremely useful. And that's what I want to talk about today. So these are methods of index theory. Um, and in a sense, it's a sort of localization within the localization. So the whole, we've already localized the, the, the integral to this, um, to this finite dimensional integral. So it started with something infinite dimensional functional integral. You went to finite dimensional. And then I'm just saying there's a, another method. You can, I mean, there is a method to compute this Z1 loop, which also uses some kind of localization. Okay? So that's optional if you want, but it's very nice. 
Um, this is very close to what uh, Leopoldo showed in the first lecture. So it, it relies on this fixed point formula of a T and bot, which I just want to, um, I want to show you how, how that happens, okay? So what you need is an off-shell algebra of the type Q squared equals to H. Right. So that's your starting point, that's your main point. So you have some theory and you have some, in fact, for, for the purposes of exposition, let me assume it's just a quantum field theory. So you have some rigid symmetry Q, okay, which squares to H. And then later I want to make comments about supergraphs. <coughs> okay, so just assume Q is some rigid symmetry of the theory. You have some fields, you have some variations. Okay, so this is generated by Q, is generated by some um, killing spinner epsilon. So the idea is the following. What you do is you, the first step is you organize all fields in representations of Q. Okay, it's off-shell. You have an off-shell theory, so Q acts on all the fields, so you want to organize the fields. And what we will call it like this. We'll say there's a bunch of fields which I'll call phi A, and then their superpartners Q phi A. These are bosonic. And then there's a bunch of fields, psi alpha and cube psi alpha. These are fermionic. So, um, so that's bosonic, and that's bosonic, and this one is fermionic, and fermionic. Okay. Let me just tell you an example instead of telling you sort of formally what this means. I'll just work this out an example. It'll become immediately clear what I'm doing. So this thing is called the cohomological basis. Okay, cohomology because you have some equivariant cohomology of this Q as Leopoldo talked about. Let me just do an example. So take n equal to one, four dimensions, chiral multiple. Okay. So if you've done any supersymmetry, this is the first example that you see. Um, so this has complex scalar phi, two fermions. Let me take them to be vial, but it's not important. I mean, one, one fermion, psi and f, OK? So this is complex, this is complex. And so this is four plus, so this is two, two, and four. So let's write the Suzy variations. Delta phi is epsilon bar psi. Okay, so you have some supersymmetry parameter epsilon naught. So you have some Suzy. Let me just call it epsilon, epsilon alpha. It's a spinner, but it's one spinner. Okay, I'm just taking one supercharge generated by some particular epsilon alpha. Okay, so that's delta phi. Then there's a delta phi bar, then delta psi alpha is epsilon bar alpha dot gamma mu alpha alpha dot d mu phi plus epsilon alpha f. Okay, I shouldn't look at the notes for this clearly. Nobody should, but I will. Um, uh, epsilon bar dot alpha alpha dot. Uh, Let me not put the indices. Okay. So indices <laughs> arrange themselves. Okay. Um, okay, so that's like basic supersymmetry. Uh, and now what uh, what this means is that huh? Yeah, yeah. So epsilon is really just a, a spinner. You just write down the killing spinner. That's okay. So yeah, I'm not worried I'm not gonna keep track of, of the anti commuting. This is just everything. These are just fields, uh, classical fields if you want. Um, now, the idea of this is that you choose this epsilon to make projections. So, so phi, so here is my, let me organize it. Uh, so this, we know what it is. So let me organize it for this example. So here, phi A is phi and phi bar, okay? So, oh, by the way, these things are called, 
Sometimes people call them elementary bosons and fermions, elementary fields. Okay, elementary bosons, elementary fermions. Phi is this. Now, I don't have space. Maybe I'll do it there. I think it's what I'm doing is clear here. So I'll use, I'll use this. So phi is phi phi bar. Q phi is this particular combination epsilon bar psi. It's one combination. Okay. And it's complex combination. Okay, so there are two here and there are two here. So I'm just using epsilon. So those are precisely the Q superpartners given in epsilon. So the Q superpartners of phi and uh, phi bar. If epsilon changes, that's going to change as well. But it's some particular combination. And the ones that appear here are the orthogonal combinations. Okay, so orthogonal in this case means you can use gamma matrix uh, algebra. Okay to do that, and cube psi, yeah, this contains f and f bar. I mean, here I'm being a little bit loose um, in this last thing because it might be some combination which, let me write it like this. Okay, it's not so important. Okay, so that's all I've done. So this, I think everybody should be completely comfortable with. Right? I've just used this supersymmetry to organize my fields, and now, it's very simple. I have these fields, and I just, so these are scalars. These are also scalars, and these are also scalars, and those are also scalars. So I've organized everything into just reps, each of which has a scalar, 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 scalar. Okay? So sometimes people call this twisting. It's, it's, it's the same. All this is the same thing. Okay? Now, once that's done, So apologies to the experts. I know there are many people who have worked on this, but I know some people asked me about this, so I thought I'll do it. So the idea now is to organize oops, the fields like this. So Q is off shell, and I have explicitly made a pairing. So when I go and compute a determinant, any whenever there's a mode here, there's a mode here. Okay? So there's an automatic cancellation of this. And that's ensured by the off-shell algebraic nature of Q. Okay? And similarly for psi and cube psi. Okay? So the horizontal direction is automatically taken care of by supersymmetry algebra. Okay? Now, when you compute a determinant, notice that now this is a fermion, this is a boson as well. So the only thing you have to check is what are the unpaired modes in the determinant of the ratio of the determinants of these two. Okay? And that's the idea. So what you want to do, you sort of algebraically write down what is this operator, okay? and then just ask what are the modes that are not paired between this operator. Okay? If I do that, I, I'll, I'll show you how. If you do that, then, then you've fully finished the determinant because you've made maximal use of supersymmetry. All, this cancellation is manifest, and this one you have to compute. Okay? That's the idea. Okay, any questions about this? One question people ask me often is, what is this operator? In order to get this operator, you have to ask, what is it you want to compute? It depends on your problem. And what we want to compute is something like this. You have psi i q psi i, where i runs over all the fermions of the theory. And what we want is, so our task is to calculate z of q v. So that means, so let me just call it determinant of QV. That means that it's firstly, it's a super determinant. Let me assume for today there's no issue with zero modes and so on. People have already talked about it. Super determinant means you, this is a bosonic object. Q is fermionic. Sorry, V is fermionic. QV is bosonic. That means that you'll have two types of term. You'll either have something like a boson. So, so roughly QV will have two types of terms, something like this, or something like that. Okay, these are just actions. And what the task is to compute the determinant of this and divide that by square root of determinant of this. Okay? That's what we want to do. So that's V, and that's so you write QV. And what now what you want to do is to take that QV and reorganize it in terms of these fields. Okay? That's an algebraic problem. Once you've done this classification of what these fields are, 
That's an algebraic problem. Yeah. No, I just said that there is, it contains, so if you really do cube psi, so here q phi is literally this. If you do cube psi, you might get f plus some other combination of this, but the, the variables which weren't, pre there are four variables, right? So two of them went there. The other two must belong here, but maybe there are linear combinations of f and something else. That's all I wanted to say. Okay. Now, as you will see, that's not important. That's why I was not very careful. The only, as I already sort of hinted at, the only thing that's important are what are the elementary fields, because everything there is taken care of by Q. All right. Okay, so the next one is to write this. Okay, so I'll do this now. Uh, I wanted one full blackboard, so let me start here. Uh, let me just do it and erase. So let me write this. Whatever it is, so I'm not, I'm not going to do it for any example. Let me just show you what the linear algebra is. So it's some, you have fermions and fermions, and psi will be now a combination of these fields, psi and q, psi, q phi. Those are the fermions of the theory. Okay, so let me write it in some kind of block diagonal form like this. So q phi, psi, okay, that just means I'm, I'm writing a vector of all those things. And there's some two cross two matrix. And here I have uh, phi times q psi. Okay, so this whole thing is fermionic. So it must be fermion boson operator, and this operator is typically linear, right? And these operators I'm going to call d00, d11, d01, d10. Okay. So I hope this procedure is clear. So what I've done is taken the Lagrangian that I have, re-expressed it in terms of these cohomological basis. But this is this looks like a, each of these d, of course, is a matrix, because each phi and psi is is a vector. Okay. And now you see that this operator is just d10 operator. Uh, so this one actually goes like this, and this one goes like this. Okay, you can just track what I mean is that in this Lagrangian, if you just, so this is q phi d00 phi. So this thing is called d00, right? Then let me do this one. I want a phi, which is here. Uh, what do I want? Phi and psi. This one is d10, so let me see how that works. D1, yeah, so phi, so the second line will be d10 times phi, and then that multiplies by psi, so that's indeed d10. So this one is d11, and this one is d0. Okay, so that's just linear algebra. Okay, so that's, um, so please keep this in mind. I'm going to erase this, but I need the space. Right, so then you compute QV, and it's once I have, once I have, so this is the non-trivial algebraic step. It takes quite some time to do it, but you can do it. Uh, once you've done it, the next step is completely trivial. I just act on this by Q, but now I use the algebra Q square equal to H. Okay, so QV looks like this. So there'll be a bosonic part and a fermionic part. Bosonic part now will have phi Q psi times something times the same thing. Okay, because now you want bosons. It's either boson, boson, or fermion, fermion. Okay, and what comes here, you can just compute. This is an exercise. It's just that. Okay, it's almost it's it's too many. It's, it's a two-line calculation. Plus, now I have the fermionic term phi q phi. Sorry, psi q phi psi. Q phi, and here is the other way around. D okay. Uh, sorry. In fact, that's not right. I'm going to organize it like this. It's Q phi psi. Excuse me. All right. Okay, good. So that's, you have to take my word for it, but it's, uh, it's, I assure you it's, it's not. If you, if you spend more than five minutes on this from here, please come and see me. I'll tell you how to do it. Okay, so now you can just write down what Z1 loop is. So what you want is 
determinant of QV fermionic divided by determinant of QV bosonic to the power half. Just here I'm using some complex notation. Okay, so bosons are always to the power half. Fermions it depends on how you write it. Let me just write it like that. But now you see, I can just read it off. These are the operators, right? Just write it as a block diagram. So it's the determinant of this operator. Sorry, determinant of this operator divided by determinant of that operator. Okay. Now as determinant, determinant of two matrices is determinant of A times determinant of B. So that's going to cancel. So all the complication is going to cancel. All you're left with is determinant of this divided by determinant of that. Okay. Here, you just have H acting on psi. Right? You just have the bottom component of this is psi H psi. Here is just phi H phi. So you're left with something very easy. Determinant of psi, so H on psi. Okay, that's all it is. Okay. Now, this is an enormous simplification because what is H? Remember, H was Q square. Q square typically is some, some uh, uh, translation and some rigid, rigid action inside your gauge theorem and so on. So that means that all you need to know is, well, so okay, all you need to compute is take that operator, the linear operator, and compute the determinants of, of that operator. It's a much simpler problem than computing this complicated uh, kinetic term that you have, okay? Now there's a further simplification for this, and that's where this uh, beautiful index theorem comes in. Okay. So firstly, notice that this can be written as, I hope everyone can see this. It's, um, so it's the same ratio of determinants. But now, uh, I'm going to make a Write it and then it will be more or less obvious to you. Right. What, I, the, what I've said here is kernel of D10 and co kernel of D10. Sorry for, maybe I'll write it again because it's important. Uh, so, where can I write it? Here. I don't want to take up another. So, this. Okay, is this visible? Yes. Determinant of H. So this equals, it's just kernel of D10 and co kernel of D10 to the power half. All I'm saying is that there's a further simplification. So H is some kind of, H roughly looks like some V mu D mu or something like this. Okay. If you act on, on all the fields in phi and psi by H, You'll see that there can be a further uh, cancellation. That cancellation is the one we've been trying to track. If there is a, you can check now that H commutes with this. Okay? And therefore, if two, there are non-zero modes paired with D10, then they won't contribute to that ratio, right? Because H commutes with this. So whenever you have a mode here with some value of H, there's always a mode here, a non-zero value of H. You have a mode here with a non-zero value of H. Okay, so there is a pairing here, but this pairing is not algebraic. How do I say it? This pairing is not sort of off shell, and uh, I don't want to say that. All I want to say is that this pairing can have zeros. There might be a kernel and co-kernel, whereas here there was nothing of the sort. Okay, we've taken, get, gotten rid of that. Okay, so the only thing you need to keep track of is the unpaired modes in this pairing. So the unpaired modes are the modes which go to zero or the modes here which don't come from anything. That's called the kernel and co-kernel. But this is only for the power of both. If you have some patience with it. No, so hold on, hold on. So, so my assumption at the beginning was that you can always organize your fields in this, in this manner. Okay, uh, so that's the next step I'm gonna do. So the example I gave you for the, was the chiral multiplet, but I'm saying, suppose you can do this kind of organization with respect to Q. Okay, what you're saying is exactly the next complication, but uh, hold your horses, just a second. All right. So, if you could, so basically, if you can organize your fields in this cohomology, cohomology complex, then that's what it boils down to. Now, what I wanted to show was that this thing, why it's so nice, is because this uh, this ratio, okay, 
um, is actually determined by something called the index of the operator D, D10. Okay, so the index of D10, uh, it's a function of t. Okay, so this is a, it's a, it's a uh, power series, which I, Lorentz series, which I define like this. Trace over kernel of D10, e to the minus i h t, minus trace of e to the minus i h t of co kernel over co kernel of T10. Suppose, so this is just a definition. And the statement is that if I know this object, I can compute this determinant. Okay, that's a moment's thought will <clears throat> show you how that works. So suppose this index it has the following form a of n e to the minus i uh, lambda n t. Okay, suppose the eigenvalues of h are lambda n. So there are um, essentially these are bosonic and fermionic as you see from here. Right? Bosonic and fermionic eigenvalues, so they can be plus or minus sign. Okay? So write this as some infinite Lorentz series. Okay? So all you have to do is to ask what is the kernel. So suppose I, can, I know what the kernel of D10 is and the co kernel. I just evaluate this. So I have not finished the sentence. So I get this. Suppose I, get I have this already. Suppose someone gives this to you. Then the determinant uh, that I want is so this determinant co kernel h over determinant of kernel h is just product over n of lambda n to the minus a n because those are the eigenvalues. Okay, this is just some formal trick, right? So th this what you want here is the eigenvalues of h okay, in the co kernel and kernel. I'm saying reorganize that. So uh, start from here if you want. Suppose this thing looks like this. It's a product of organ values. First, you make this series, okay, for the index. Okay, now we are in business because uh, I'm going to erase this because there's a very pretty formula um, for the index. Okay, so there's a nice formula I'm, I'm going to present in a second for the index. Once I have that formula, I can read off the eigenvalues, plug it into this calculator. So the formula is this. Um, it's by Maybe I move here. So it's roughly half an hour, no? Michele? Yes. Yeah, yeah, good. So the formula is the following. So this is a T about fixed point formula for this index, it says that, okay, there are technical conditions about, about this operator D10 that we've been talking about. I'm not gonna discuss that. Please look up the papers. So it has to be a certain, so it's a differential operator and there's some conditions on it. It's called transversal ellipticity and so on. And so suppose you have some manifold. So this is your space-time manifold, okay? So this is, let, let me just call it, Space time, of course, it's Euclidean, so maybe I shouldn't say it. Manifold, but this this will be our ADS two times S two or S four or whatever you have, and on this there are fields. Okay, those fields in this in this theorem will be called sections of some bundles. Or I think most of you know this better than I do. But essentially, there's some space time with some fields, and H has an action on space time. Okay, like this. Call this x tilde, and then the index of d10 of t, as a function of t, is the following. It's just so. R remember that the index actually is a function of the operator defined on the whole manifold, right? That's, it's a very complicated thing still a priori. There's some differential operator which is local. Okay. And the statement is that that index reduces to the fixed points of H on the space-time manifold. So it says that you look at all X, it says that X tilde equal to H, X, and then you just look at trace of E to the minus IHT, kernel minus co-kernel, and I'm gonna write this in physics notation. Essentially, that's just minus onto the F, F, okay? But now only at that point, okay, divided, by determinant of one minus 
dx tilde. There's some geometric, uh, some kind of, this comes from some Jacobian factor, as, as I'm sure all of you have seen. And this trace, remember, goes, should run over the kernel and co-kernel of d10. But remember, d10 just took phi to psi. Oops. Okay, that was what d10 was. Okay. So I don't actually lose any information by just saying that this is a trace over phi and psi. I can keep the massive modes as well. They'll automatically cancel. Okay. And that's your final formula. And it's a very beautiful formula. Uh, and you'll see how powerful it is in a second. Yeah. H has to be compact, yeah. All right. So what has happened is that the whole index calculation has reduced to <coughs> some over fixed points on the space-time manifold. Let's assume these are discrete. So it's just a quantum mechanics problem. So what you have to do is to find, write down your, so the algorithm is the following. Start, an off, start with an off-shell Q, Q squared is some H, it's some, some D phi or something like this. Ask what are the fixed points of that operator on the manifold. Just take your fields, organize them into this cohomology basis, and then just ask, all you need to know is what are the charges of the fields at that point. So essentially, how do the fields rotate near the fixed point? Okay. So it's a, it's a very simple quantum mechanical problem, the whole thing reduced to. All the complication is to actually find, goes into constructing this complex. Okay, once you've done that, now it's a machine. This trace from? Yeah, yeah, okay, so thank you. So maybe it's at that point, phi of x, psi of x. So that's what I said. This is really a quantum mechanics problem. So yeah, thank you. I should have said it's not a trace over the field space, but just the quantum mechanical modes of those fields at that point, at the fixed point. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now I'm gonna do, apply this to our problem. So in our case, Uh, so in our case, we have some ADS2 times NS2. ADS2, and remember Q square was L0 minus J0, okay? L0 was this, so fixed points of L0 means the center of ADS2. R0 equal to one in my notation, okay, there's only one fixed point, and you also need a fixed point the J0, so that means that it's these, these two points, okay? So there are two fixed points. J0 went like this. The North Pole and South Pole of the sphere that sits at the origin of ADS2, okay? There's just two points, and the task is now to compute the charges of all the fields and this determinant. So let me do it extremely quickly. So first let's do the determinant. <coughs> so let me write ADS2 times S2 in this complex coordinates. So that's the stereographic projection, dz, dz bar over one plus zz bar square. That's the, uh, it's the same stereograph, it's not stereographic, it's, it's the same construction for ADS2, therefore there's a minus. Okay. Uh, L square here is the size of the ADS2, but now I'm going to remember in some, so let me write. L square is, the physical L square is just e to the minus k of phi. Okay, that's the physical size of your manifold, remember, right? So this was, if you want, square root of g in the physical metric. Huh? K was the Kähler potential. K, e to the minus k is minus i xi fi bar minus xi bar. Sorry, sorry? Phi plus IPI, thank you. So I can speak up, please. That's K on the metric. Yes. Then phi is on X. Then phi is on what? Yes. So 
Sorry, I'm not, I, I don't understand what you're saying. Can I just pick up, I, I just can't hear you actually. Yeah, I have a killer potential, there it is. There's a solution. Yes. Yes. Is x times? Yeah. Okay. Phi is my coordinate on the. Yeah. Uh huh. Solution is x times l plus phi. Yes. So x is the answer to phi. X is sorry. I I, I know you're saying something, <laughs> which is important, but. This is a computation of the metric. Yes. L. Yes. Yes. Look, all I'm saying here is that there is a there's a certain size to the to the ADS metric. Right? It's like in our paper what we call square root of g. Maybe it, does that help if I write that? How do I? Yeah. Yes. Okay, can you say what you think should be, you, are you saying this is incorrect or something? I just don't understand your statement. It shouldn't, what should this be? Okay, then can we just take it offline? Can, can we discuss this afterwards? So, can we discuss this? Okay, I can give you a reference for this and we can discuss this later. I, I really don't understand exactly what you're saying. So the references are, I mean, you know the references. So there's one paper that I wrote with uh, Valentin Rice, who's skipped. Um, and um, another uh, that Imtak Jeon, who also skipped, uh, wrote with uh, two other collaborators. Ah, Imtak is there. Maybe Imtak can explain to you. Is there a question with the metric being imaginary as well? No, the, this, is, this is a e to the minus k turns out to be real. You see, this is a, it's a real thing. Okay, let me let me carry on and, and we'll come back to this. It's okay. So what are the fixed points? The fixed points are w equal to zero and z equal to zero and z equal to so combined with z equal to zero and one over z equal to zero. Okay, those are the two fixed points. Okay, w equal to zero is here, z equal to zero is here, one over z equal to zero is here. Okay, so then you can easily compute the determinant of one this thing is one minus Q square times one minus Q inverse square, where Q is e to the minus it over L. All right. So that's the determinant. That's very easy to compute. And then you have that you want to compute this trace, this small trace um, of e to the minus i h t at the fixed points over phi and psi. So this equals. It turns out to be equal. So there are four for this. Ah, now I have to say what it is. So, uh, so far everything was very general, and now I'm going to do this for the hypermultiplet. Okay, for which there is actually an off-shell formulation. If you take, uh, so this is for hypermultiplet. If you take one supercharge. Okay, and that's just uh, minus two q, one minus q inverse square. Okay, there are eight modes in the hypermultiplet. There are four bosons and four fermions, and those are the eight modes. Minus, so it's minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one, sorry. Plus one, plus one, minus one, minus one, zero, 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 zero. Those are the charges. Okay, you just have to compute. Okay, so I put this all together, and what you get is, whoa, sorry now. What you get is Z1 loop is product of n greater equal to 1 minus n over L ADS. Those are the eigenvalues. I uh, should write this. Ah. Continue here. So this implies that the index is minus 2q over 1 minus q inverse square divided by that. So it's 1 minus q square. So it's sum n greater equal to 1 n q to the n, uh, four, four n. So this is at the North Pole. So this is at the North Pole. And there's a similar computation at the South Pole. So you get 2 plus 2, which is 4. And you put this, OK, uh, 4, uh, 4 n. Sorry. 
OK? All right. So from this, then you can just read off what is the, the determinant. It's just that to the power of 4n. OK? Those are the eigenvalues. n over L, L ADS is the, is the eigenvalue. And the degeneracy is 4n. So I just write that. Okay. This was so the hyper. OK? So you get this. And so now you see there's some infinite product, and you have to do some zeta function regularization. The numerator is just some number which I don't care about. What I want really is how the determinant scales as a function of this LADS. So you can see this is just equal e to the minus k uh, times, uh, so minus 2k times, uh, actually it's, yeah, minus k times sum over n n being equal to 1 uh, times 2. You can just check that. And so that becomes just e to the minus. That's minus 1 over plus k uh, plus k over 12. OK, so that's minus 1 over 24. And by zeta function, and you get this. OK, so it was a little bit sketchy, but that's the main point. OK, so this is how you compute determinants. So if you have nh hypermultiplets, and that's going to be multiplied by nh. So remember this formula I showed you, e to the k over 12 times nv minus. That's how you get this. I might have made sign errors. I'm in a little bit of a hurry. OK, so that's, I just wanted to give you an idea of how the determinant works. OK? Now, I have about 15 minutes left, roughly 13, 13 minutes left. Uh, let me, what I want to do now, I want to use the, the projector. Um, so this was what I just showed you. This is. Right, you have these fixed points. You have to do this thing, and you do it for for the hypermultiplet, and you get this. Okay. Now, um, now the next question is: You want to do this for uh, the next level of complication? Is you want to do this for the vector multiplet? Okay. Why is that a complication? And this is what I want to spend some time on. Why is that a complication? So the complication comes in the very first step. The starting point is you want to organize your fields in representations of off-shell supersymmetry. But let's look at the fields. So the vector n equal to 2 vector multiplet looks like this. There's an a mu. I'm going to use this, so if you can't see, then just either move or, yeah. Uh, there's a vector field, a complex scalar, which I write as x1, x2, um, y, i, j, which is this uh, auxiliary field, and uh, these are the gauge in uh, I used to call this omega until now, but now it's lambda. Okay. But now you count degrees of freedom. So here there are eight degrees of freedom in the fermions. In the bosons, there are three, four, five. And then there's a gauge field. So if you put the gauge invariance, it's three. So it's also eight. So it should be eight plus eight, as Stefan said. But here, we want to do everything off shell. We want to do everything off shell. And you don't want to, so there are two options you can do. You can either say, if I want to do off shell, I must gauge fix to get eight plus eight degrees of freedom. That's one way of doing it. Okay. But if I gauge fix a supersymmetry variation, Sorry, if I gauge fix a gauge multiplet, you'll see that supersymmetry is not consistent with that. Start with some gauge for a mu. Take the Lorentz gauge for a mu. Act on it by q, act on it by q back, and you're out of the Lorentz gauge. Okay. And you'll see that in a second, actually. It's a, this is a very small calculation. If you've not done this, you should do this. So here, here are the variations. Q a mu is some function of lambda. Q lambda is, is some function of f and d mu x and y i j and so on. And you'll see, so if you just naively compute q square, you'll get q square is some v mu d mu. D mu, v mu is this fermion bilinear. That's the killing vector I have. D mu is partial d mu plus something inside the, uh, in this case, there is nothing else. Actually, it's just partial d mu plus a gauge transformation with parameter being x. So field dependent gauge transformation. Okay. Um, this is not something they teach you in high school, but anyone who, has actually done this, has run into this problem. Okay. This problem becomes more serious in supergravity, but already at, at just U1 gauge, Maxwell gauge uh, multiplet, you have this problem. It's not a problem. It's just that Q square equal to H is not, is not really true. It's, it's equal to H plus some gauge variation. Of course, in physics, you don't care about it because you say it's, it's still a symmetry. Here, I care about it because I, don't want to, I want to do a functional integral with gauge fixing and so on. And gauge symmetry is no longer a symmetry. Right? I want to use this off-shell formulation. Right. Let me emphasize that. I want to do a functional integral a la Fajir Popov, so I put a gauge fixing term. Once I put a gauge fixing term, there is gauge symmetry is no longer a symmetry. 
right? I only have BRST or something. Okay, so that's one issue. And th here you can also see that if I start with a certain gauge, I'll get out of that gauge because of this variation, okay? So one thing people do is to actually gauge fix by hand and you can modify the supersymmetry transformation according to the gauge so that you, you stay within the gauge. That's a little bit ugly. You can do it and you have to do it case by case. But there's another nice way to do it covariantly. It's much more elegant. But there, if you want to do it covariantly, you have to ask, uh, fight this problem, that the number of degrees of freedom are not the same. There's nine and eight. But covariantly means that you put ghosts, and there are two fermionic ghosts, so BC and capital B. Okay, that's the Lagrange multiplier. So that's one boson and two fermions. And indeed, miraculously, you have 10 plus 10 degrees of freedom. Okay, so there's some hope to realize the offshell algebra on all these 10 plus 10 fields. There are still problems. The problem is what do you do with this? Okay, that's one problem. The second problem is what is Q on the ghost? So I, I introduced new fields, but I haven't told you how supersymmetry acts on these fields. Okay, in fact, no one tells you how supersymmetry, they're not supposed to be in supersymmetry multiples. Okay, so what you do, this problem is, is, is an old one and people have solved it long ago. Use the fact that there is a BRST charge which acts on this BC. So I mean an abelian theory, so Q of C is zero. Q of small b is big B. So that's the, sometimes this is called the ghost, anti-ghost, and Lagrange multiplier. So then you make this combination called Q plus Q BRST, called Q equivariant. And let's look at this algebra. So Q equivariant square is Q square plus Q BRST square plus the anti-commutator. Q square is H plus delta gauge. Q BRST square is zero. And this anti-commutator is what it is. What you want is you want Q square, Q equivariant squared equal to H. I want to construct a charge which is really equal to H. And now it's uh, the two problems cancel each other. Remember, this thing acts on all the fields. So I just demand that these two are canceled. Right? And A, it get rid, gets rid of this gauge variation. If, and it also tells you how Q acts on the ghost. So there's a consistent way that Q acts on the ghost by just solving this plus this equal to zero. Okay, and that's the answer. So that's how you do it, and now you have Q equivalent square equal to H, genuinely offshell. Okay. Once I have this, I have this 10 plus 10 degrees of freedom, I have to repeat this whole exercise, write down how this Q equivariant acts on it, organizes into these boxes, run the whole program, and what you'll get is exactly E to the minus K over 12 for one vector multiplet. Okay, I still have maybe three, four minutes. Maybe ah, I have more, I have yeah. seven, eight minutes actually, yeah. Ah, good, 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 yeah. Yeah, question, question, yes. Maybe it's stupid now. So if you have this Q equivariant, yes. you're going to have to reconstruct all your Q equivariant variations in your algebra, and you're going to be like, or it's all going to be this. You already have your So what's going to happen is here, so now this is going to be, Q is going to be replaced by Q equivariant. So it's just Q plus QB. So let's take the, for, let's take the boson. Q plus QB. Q is this. What is QB of AMU? QB of AMU is a gauge transformation with gauge parameter replaced by ghost. So QB of this is that plus D mu of C. Here nothing happens and so on. Okay, well, this is a completely algorithmic way to write it. Right? So it's slightly more complicated, but it's nice. So once you do this, you get, yeah. Okay. So here are your 10 fields. And you want to organize this into boxes. And uh, as I said, one nice way to do it is write these sort of, uh, make these epsilon projections. So these are typically, this is what is called twisting. So you take epsilon. In the chiral multiplet, I just did epsilon psi. Here is the same thing. That's a scalar. Then I can form a, a, a vector and a two form, symmetric two form. So that's one plus four plus three. Those are the eight degrees of freedom. I just reorganized my eight degrees of freedom according to epsilon. Okay, I've just done epsilon projections, and because of the twist, I, I, I just get bosons. And when you do this organization, you'll see that what lives in the elementary fields is A mu and X2, and that's one part of the uh, complex scalar. And in the elementary fermions, you have, so QB of A mu is precisely lambda mu. That has to be, there's only one vector, and so on. Q mu of, QB, sorry, Q equivariant of A mu is lambda mu, plus D mu C, and, that's, that's. and here, these three fields sit here, and B and C sit here, okay? So that's, this takes some time to do, but you can do it. 
Okay, you run this, and as I said, you get you do the same thing. You get so in general, you get something like this: the z1 loop is e to the minus a k, a hyper is this, a vector is that. If you put this into the original formula that I started with today and I ended with yesterday, you'll find and then start do some saddle point evaluation. You'll see that the black hole entropy goes as area over four plus um, this number a naught times log of a h. Okay. So the leading log correction is actually just now just a sum of uh, this thing, which was this two minus chi over twelve that I showed you. Okay. This so after having gathered all the technology. If, you, if you're just interested in some leading log, which people were interested for a long time, um, it becomes a two-line calculation okay, after all this technology. But you've, of course, the reason to do this is not to only calculate A0, but to calculate the whole function. Uh, but of course, it's consistent. Very good. Now, now in the last five minutes, I want to talk about one more thing. Um, yeah. OK, thank you very much. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I'll just go slowly and I'll finish. I have a few more slides. Um, actually, one question for Jean. Are you going to talk about this Bessel function and so on at all? Then I won't show it. You have a slide with the numbers and so on? Yes. Good, then I won't show it. No, no, that's fine. But OK, so then I want to talk about a formal thing. So the simplest example was just a chiral multiplet when there was no issue of gauge invariance. The next example was a gauge multiplier, regular A mu gauge Maxwell field. Now we want to do this for supergravity. Right? So this was a thorny problem. It stayed for a long time. Um, what is the problem? In fact, there are two problems. It's not just a technical problem of computing determinants. Okay? There was that problem which was around for a long time. But in fact, this whole story of localization has to be revisited because the starting point of localization is that I have a path integral, so in, in the context of a gauge theory, it's some for the upper of times type gauge fixed path integral. And I need a rigid symmetry. I need a rigid supersymmetry Q, which squares to a rigid symmetry called H. That was how the whole localization argument went on. Okay. But, okay, sorry, this I want to skip. This was, maybe I'll show this later, if at all, but otherwise, yeah. So, or maybe I'll just show you exactly. Mm, no, it'll waste time. So, so I want to keep the momentum. There's a slogan which you might have heard that there is no global symmetry in gravity. Okay. You, you might have heard it in different ways. Um, I, some, sometimes you must you heard there's no global symmetry in gravity. Other times you'll say, well, it takes supergravity. Supergravity is a theory of gauge symmetries, including supersymmetry. Supersymmetry is also gauge symmetry in supergravity, unlike in quantum field theory. And if you have a, but gate symmetry is not a symmetry of the action because I have gate fixed. Right. It's another slogan you've heard is gate symmetry is a redundancy of description. It's not really a symmetry. All these things you have to start worrying about now. What the hell am I doing at step zero? Right. So a lot of people actually worried about this already, you know, like at the point where I was two lectures ago when I said, let's start with supergravity and do the variations. And many people said, well, but what does this even mean? And we say, well, I gave you this kind of thing which sounded nice that you solve for all geometries which admit some supersymmetry, something like this. Okay. But now you can do it in a better way. So this is true. Well, this is kind of true, but it's, we know that this is not true if there is a boundary. Okay. Like take ADS CFT. Okay. If I have ADS CFT, the symmetries, the global symmetries of the bulk theory is also a symmetry by the statement of ADS CFT. It must be a global symmetry of the bulk theory. Right. If the if the boundary theory has a rotation, it's also a rotation in the in the bulk theory. Now again, this is a little bit of confusion you might have had if you're actually a little more advanced. You're like, well, global symmetries in the bulk is realized as gate symmetries in the boundary, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there's always a global part of it which is not local. You can't write a local current in the bulk, but there is a global symmetry. Okay. So. The way to do this is the following. So think of the path integral. You fix a background. Let's just fix ADS2 times S2, the fully supersymmetric background. And then the idea is to fluctuate, integrate over all possible fluctuations, okay, not just small fluctuations. Now, this prescription, of course, loses some very high-level background independence. Okay. 
But I didn't expect anything more than that because ADS-CFT asked me to fix the boundary conditions anyway. So I'm taking the fixing the boundary conditions, pulling that into the interior with some fixed solution, background solution, and then fluctuating over all, integrating over all fluctuation. The question is how to do this. Okay, so you have to implement this. You want some super global supersymmetry, which squares to some rigid super. So near the boundary, the boundary conditions that I said admit such a thing. The boundary condition is just ADS two times S two. There I know there's a Q square equal to H. And so if I just declare the background to be ADS two times S two, there's a Q square equal to H everywhere. But now I want to ask how does that act on all the fluctuations of the graviton? And then I want to ask how should I gauge fix that? Okay, that's the technical problem. Okay, so that's a little bit difficult. And what, what this suggests, I mean, the words I'm saying reminds you of the background field method in gauge theory. That you fix some background, there's some symmetry of that, and then there's some fluctuations on which there are now, there's a gauge symmetry of the fluctuations and a background symmetry, and you want to integrate out the gauge, gauge degrees of freedom. Right? That's the background field method. Unfortunately, the background field method has not been developed for supergravity, unless, except in very exceptional cases where there's some superfield formalism, okay? Certainly not for this. Now, that's the first question, okay? So first sort of deep question, conceptual question. The second question is, relates to this determinant calculation. That one. Suppose I want to do this like I did, then you would have said, well, now you did a mu, so first I did chiral multiplets, you say what about gate symmetry, I showed you how to do for a mu, so now what about supergravity? And what I need to do is to tell you what these twisted variables are. That's my first step, these cohomological variables. And then again you run into this problem because supersymmetry doesn't respect choice, uh, gauge of, choice of gauge and so on. So there are two methods like I said, so you either change Q or introduce Gauss and do this thing. This was the method we saw so far, but in supergravity, there is only Q BRST, there is no Q. There is no rigid symmetry to begin with. The only rigid symmetry is Q BRST, but Q BRST squares to zero. It's an impotent object, okay? So everything seems to be a problem. So at best you have something like that, but you want some equivalent algebra and you want to twist, okay? So I'm effectively going to leave you with these problems. I'll just tell you how these are solved and uh, if you're not gonna be present next week, please come talk to me because There'll be two talks next week, one by Bernard DeWitt and one by Imtak Cheon, is sitting there, um, who's going to essentially answer uh, question one and question two. Okay, so let me sketch what the answer is. So the answer for question one is that, so I should tell you very quickly what the problem is. The problem, the technical problem of um, why uh, you can't do background field quantization for supergravity is that the, the gauge algebra uh, is not a Lie algebra. If you have a Lie algebra, you just take out Peskin Schroeder and just write it down, right? It's not a Lie algebra. The structure constants are not constants, and they're field dependent. So if, if you don't know this, you should read this book which Stefan brought by uh, Friedman. Friedman and from Van Fruyen. Uh, they explain it very nicely, but um, there's also many other review talks, uh, review papers. Um, so that's really the problem. But this is already a supersymmetric gauge theory, right? If you have soft algebra. Have no, not for, your gauge theory is, is just, uh, so U1, of course, it's, it's very trivial, but even if you take non-abelian, it's a Lie algebra. But the gauge term you add, you yeah. get H plus gauge term. Yeah, gauge but, term but, but supersymmetry itself is rigid. So you don't even run into this problem. That's, so you can just fix that by the fix that I, I just gave you, this, mm -hmm. this thing. I mean, not I, it goes past to Bullio Singer and, and so on. This is the thing that was used in Pestoon and Hammond. That's completely fixable. Here, you, you, you're, you know, you're compelled to face this problem of, of solving this thing. Okay, so what we do is we develop, oops, the BRST quantization. Uh, first, we just do BRST quantization, okay? But doing a background split. So we tell you how to do a background split in theories for generic gauge algebra, including these soft gauge algebras, namely when the field uh, structure constant are field dependent. That's a, that's a new thing, and I think that's very, very interesting. Um, the next thing we do is once you have such a thing, we actually, we show that there's a consistent deformation of this algebra, uh, which gives you an equivariant charge. Okay, this deformation depends on the background, okay, as it should in ADS-CFT and you just get this, but this is now a rigid symmetry. 
Okay, so we actually construct such a rigid symmetry. So it's, it's nice from many points of view. Firstly, it solves this problem I'm talking about, but very generally, um, it tells you how to do, in a sense, at least formally, quantization uh, of supergravity. N not the UV problem, but these formal problems. And once you have localization, you can do it. And then you can sort of, for mathematicians, you can present the answer as a definition of this class of supersymmetric integrals. So that's the first resolution. The second resolution is now you have a, Q, a rigid thing. You just organize all the fields. Okay, this is a, uh, now the number of fields. In fact, I forgot how many fields. So you, you started with 24 plus 24 of supergravity. Here, for the gauge multiplet, you started with you know, 8 plus 8, which became 10 plus 10. For the supergravity multiplet, you start with 24 plus 24, but help me, I think it becomes 96, something like 96 plus 96, because there's an enormous amount of gauge symmetries. The whole gauge algebra of supergravity has to be now gauge fixed. So you, you give goes for all of them. Of course, it's reducible. Um, and you make this big complex. But OK, it's, a, it's an algebraic exercise. We spend pages doing it. And at the end of the day, you have a small table. That's all. OK? And, and that essentially computes this, this pairing. Huh? Black hole. I defined BH in my very first lecture, black hole. <laughs> if, you, if you've taken notes, you can check this. So yeah, so we call this the black hole cohomology. It's the, it's the cohomology of the supersymmetric black hole. That's the title. The title of the paper is also something like that. I forgot what it is, BPS, something like this. OK, okay so I think I'm going to stop here. Uh, so this paper, so there's a, uh, so both these things, the resolutions, Please uh, look for these talks. Uh, Bernard, I think Val will talk about something else, but Bernard will talk about this for sure, and Imtak will talk about this. All right, thank you very much.